sponsoring all of Dallas Art Week the entire week. Bella Wood, Touch Titans, Dev Mountain, Circus, Circus or Circus? Circles. Circles. Crit, I, that's for the debate in the Credos. And many, many more, especially boxer property, which my friend Doug over here is going to talk about. Yep. So, First off, I just want to say that Boxer Property is really happy to host Dallas Startup Week this week and have many sessions held here on the 20th floor of 1910 Pacific. We have 36 buildings throughout Dallas, um, about six to ten of which have work style suites, which are executive co-working environments that are perfect for startups. A lot of shared amenities, things like that, uh, which you can check out back at our table over here. But I especially want to mention that if anybody here is interested in work style spaces, taking a tour at any point, uh, we have a great exclusive deal for Dallas startup attendees only, and that deal is six free months of rent on just a one-year term or greater. So it's a great opportunity to rent office space, whether it's your first one or looking to um, expand or get into another environment more formal with some great uh, space and have access to all of our work style buildings by leasing and just one of them. Uh, it's a great way to expand your business. All right, thank you guys. Awesome. Thank Thanks. you. But unless you've been living under a rock, I don't know if you don't know about Danielle. Danielle is an icon in the Dallas Art community. I'm not just saying that because she paid me, but she really is. Um, she was formerly at DBJ, started a Tech Flash newsletter, which was one of the first ones in the major publications to cover the Dallas startup scene and technology scene. She's been pioneering the startup community for many years now. And she, well, you have, and now she's most recently the managing editor at D Magazine. DCEO. DCEO. Part of D Magazine. Part of D Magazine, uh, which is a big magazine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows. Brad is the CEO of Ustream. Thank you, Brad. Really appreciate you. Which right. sold to IBM, correct? Ustream is live stream video, and you guys have covered things like Barack Obama and a couple of celebrities, um, like, oh, Hillary Clinton, John Edwards, the Plain White Tees, and <laughs> some other ones, like uh, Tori Amos. There we go. So, <laughs> <laughs> I like Tori Amos. Everyone's so hot. I do. You also went to West Point, something that not a lot of people know unless you go to this. Uh, anything else that you would like to add? Yeah, I'm from Texas. Yeah, you are a Texas boy. So thank you for coming very much. Very, very proud of you making it. So one thing that we're really emphasizing here is start here, exit here. So even, especially in Dallas, we have opportunities to start here. But people think that they need to move on to make a big exit. Even though Brad's not from Dallas per se, he is from Texas. He started here and he did exit here. So he's a good... Kind of. <laughs> just say yes. Um, just agree. Yeah, just, but uh, good example. And you can clarify. Yeah. Uh, we'll go through that. We'll go through the whole thing. So, without further ado, Daniel? Thank you, Paula. She's so nice. Isn't she nice? Um, anyways, uh, so Brad, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. We have a nice little intimate group here. So uh, hopefully get some great chatter going on um, as we go on. Um, but I want to actually start from the beginning because I don't know how many people know Brad's full story. So I want to start all the way back from when Ustream was just, you know, you weren't doing anything with Ustream. It was just an idea, a thought. So let's start at the genesis. Where did this how far back do we go, and when did this thought enter your mind? The, <clears throat> the thought to start an internet company or the thought to start um, Ustream specifically? Well, let's do both. Does uh, anybody remember back in the days when there were bulletin board systems? Anybody old enough to be a geek? I know you're old enough, Ryan. <laughs> but um, before the internet was around, for those who don't know what a bulletin board system, you used to call into people's computers with a modem to call directly into one. And so um, I, I did that as a very young age. Come on in, come on in. <laughs> we need more people. <laughs> we have plenty of room, I mean. But, the, uh, but so, so I, I started a bulletin board system like at age like 11 to 13 to 12. And so my dad was an early adopter and I, I was a self-taught programmer. And I was always into 
you know, technology at that point. And I knew I always wanted to do it, do, get, do something in tech at some point. Um, then I went to West Point, uh, which is a military school. I had to go in the Army for five years. I graduated from West Point in June of 2001, so like literally right before September 11th. Um, so it was a very busy time, obviously, in the military, and I did that. I'm very proud I've done that. And when I got out of the military, I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do. Um, and I was able to get, a, get in with the Perot family here locally, um, Ross Perot and his son, Ross Jr., and work for one of their companies called Hillwood, which is a real estate development company. Nothing to do with tech at all. Yeah. But what was cool about it, what I enjoyed about it was I would, from a man, just like, I, and I, was, I had no corporate experience. Like, so, I mean, it's hard. When you get in the military, it's actually kind of hard to get a job because your skill set, you know, driving a tank doesn't exactly translate to anything else in the normal world. Um, and, or at least most people don't think it does. And so the, so, but the, but the pro family hire, they hire a lot of veterans. And I, I did real estate development. And I, what I enjoyed about it is on the one, one day I could, one minute I could be talking to the mayor of, Dallas. The next minute, I was talking to an engineering firm about how to design the the, the neighborhood, the, you know, the water and the sewers. Then the next minute, I was talking to, to the landscape people around, you know, what kind of flowers we were going to choose in the, in the front. And then two minutes later, I was talking to a guy in a dozer, telling him to save a certain tree because I didn't want to lose that tree. Um, and it was, it was a really interesting experience. And and then the real estate market was starting to tank. Um, and I, I knew I wanted to get, get into tech in um, some form or fashion, and, got, and I'd started a previous uh, tech company while I was in the Army with a group of guys. We got back together, and the original genesis for what we do, which today Ustream really is a, is a full-service video platform, primarily for media companies and enterprises, um, but the original genesis came from that experience in the military that I had. Uh, and trying to help soldiers and sailors, you know, communicate. You know, they were missing their kid's wedding or their daughter's graduation, um, or they were missing, like, an, when I missed the Super Bowl because there wasn't, this is, again, this is all early video. And so we wanted to build a technology that could solve that problem and, and you know, ultimately grew into what, what it grew into. So you now have the idea. Um, what steps did you take early on to get it started? I'm assuming there was some early investment money that had to come into play here just to launch. Um, start us, you know, baby steps. Where did you go after the idea? We um, initially, just with credit cards of our own, um, I happened to have the largest credit limit, which was $15,000 at the time. And so most of it went on my credit card originally. Um, and then we, and then we, we, you know, we, um, what happened with, and, and sort of got lucky in this, does not happen very often, I don't think, in Dallas. But when I when I left the Perot's, um, I went to Ross Jr. and told them I had this idea and it was starting. To, we were gonna I was gonna take a swing at it, um, and literally he gave me a three hundred thousand dollar check as I quit from Hillwood, um, and so that's not the normal initial capital story. Um, I, I had a Ford pickup truck and I took that money. And I sold my I didn't buy my Ford. I didn't buy a car with it. I sold my Ford pickup truck bought a uh, little car and drove it to California, and that was our initial capital. Then we, ended, we ultimately we raised, um, you know, and this was before 2007, 2008, you know, the term accelerator was not even in any kind of vocabulary. Um, angel funds were, not, were sort of scarce. Uh, mostly what you would raise back then were traditional, either your friends and family or just really rich guys. Um, and so we did a lot of that from a lot of really rich guys in Silicon Valley and some here. Um, and then we raised our, you know, and then we raised more traditional rounds later on. So you get this big fat check and now you have the funds to do this. Uh, tell me how you get the team. I mean, we're talking early stage, getting this all, all the pieces together. And you just mentioned you got some Silicon Valley funding too. I mean, walk us through some of, some of these pulling these different, um, I guess, threads to, to bring all the pieces together. Um, and I'm assuming there's other entrepreneurs in the room. Um, you know, starting a company is just crazy. Uh, you know, and I, I, th I look back in the early days and where my company is now, you know, when, when, when we exited, we had two, over 200 people. We're going to be 600 here in very shortly. Um, and I, and it's funny, I look back at that time and it's just, it was just, it's just, it's like controlled chaos in my mind. And I think one of the things that, that I've seen resonate repeatedly with startup founders that have been successful in, in startups that have been successful, they have a 
crazy their, their, their ability to execute is almost better than their ability to think strategically. What I mean by that is they're real good at just sort of going and making decisions and moving fast and aggressively and staying tenacious, probably more so than they are about having some, some sort of strategic plan. So we kind of knew what we wanted to do. We wanted to do a video thing, and we're, but what we really were doing was just going, and we're just sort of following either where the money was or where the users were. Um, and I, the analogy I use is like, in the, you know, you go up to a stop sign, you either go left or you go right, and you choose a direction, you go, and you, you keep doing that. And that's, that was, that I've seen that repeatedly. So in the early days, it was just a lot of just, we need this, we need this, what do we need? Okay, go this way, or we go this way. And you're sort of, I mean, you have a general idea, but you're guiding it through a series of just very aggressive and very tenacious, and, and, you know, uh, decisions um, that are, are decisive. <clears throat> I've, you know, I've advised companies I've uh, invested in, in startups. I've been around a lot of tons of startups. Um, and what I tend to see the ones that aren't as successful um, is they, they think to almost overthink things um, and don't make decisions and don't just you know, do, do what needs to happen. At the end of the day, it's about building your product. It's about the customer. It's about watching the data. Um, and some startups, I think it's not drinking coffee. It's not going to no offense, not going to events like this. I mean, it's hard work. <laughs> and I mean, like, yeah, but you know what I'm saying? It's that, that building a business is hard and, and, it's, and it's long hours. And um, so I don't know if I answered the question or not. But. Gotcha. So um, tell me about, I mean, your headquarters is not here. <laughs> but you're from here. So tell me about that choice to, because a lot of the debate that we talk about today is, you know, why are we not keeping the startups here? Now, granted, Back then, it was a different story than it is today. But let's go back to back when you were starting up. Why choose San Francisco? And I mean, you had the Hillwood connection here. You had a big fat check from here. What took you to San Francisco? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it is it is a little bit tough. To, I, I'll tell you the answer, but it is tough to compare back then, 2007 to, to now. Um, I, do, I do think they are different. We're in a different place in terms of starting companies and entrepreneurship and fundraising, e even in Dallas, as much as we like to complain about it. Because I have a company here in Dallas as well that we raise money for, it, and it certainly wasn't easy. Um, and another different, a different company. But, the, but so I, back then, though, you know, it was, it was real simple. Um, <laughs> and again, I, I, did, I was in tech, or I knew tech, but I didn't, I didn't completely, I hadn't started an internet company before. But I knew Yahoo was there, I knew Facebook was there, I knew Google was there, and I just looked at the list, and I'm like, well, there's something going on here. Um, and back then, you know, the, the best venture capitalists, the biggest venture capitalists in the world were on, they're literally on one street back then, San Hill Road. I mean, you could literally go one meeting and walk, one meeting and walk, one meeting and walk. I mean, it was, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, and, and we knew talent was there, and, and you know, everything, there was just a lot of momentum. It felt like the gold rush to me a little bit back in the, in the day. Uh, and, and so, you know, I didn't have, you know, I grew up in Granbury, Texas, and I, you know, it's not like I had a ton of connections here. I came from a real estate company. Um, and so in the tech community, I don't, it's not like I knew a lot of people. Um, I later got to know Cuban, but that was like much later, you know, in the, in, in, in my, in my, in the history of the company. And so, you know, it was, um, in, I, it, this was where I felt like it was at. Now today, um, I, I, I am certainly, it's not as easy to fundraise here as it is in Silicon Valley or maybe even Austin. Um, but it, it is a very different thing than it, what it was back then. There weren't accelerators. There weren't, you know, actual funds. I mean, we can, we can always want more capital, but access to things on the internet, you know, access to blogs like Ryan writes. I mean, that stuff just was not out there, advice and, and whatnot. You know, term sheets that you can get for free, you know, that, are, that have good terms. And so it was, just, it was a different thing. And that's where all the knowledge was sort of felt like it was sort of kept and I needed that knowledge. And so I had to go there. So then you, you start up the company, um, immediately start getting, um, some customer adoption there, but you start to see the model shift. Tell me a little bit about, um, going in what you were expecting to build. And then, like you said, as a startup, you were just following the path, following where it took you and your model did shift. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was the most stressful period of my life. Um, the so the early days of Ustream, for those who don't know it, it, it was it, what inspired us, you know, to do it from a tech platform. And YouTube, I believe, had just sold. Um, in the early days, we literally put Chad and Steve's faces on our desk as inspiration from the YouTube guys, and they um, they built a platform that was obviously based on video on demand, um, and, and a really cultural phenomenon. And we wanted to do something similar with live, and so we were consumer property 
you know, we would do, I mean, Charlie Sheen went crazy on Ustream. We did, we did a ton of celebrity stuff. We did Obama's inauguration. Um, his victory speech was official victory speech was powered by us. Um, all, all sorts of just to, to all the stuff you see on Periscope today, we were doing all that years ago. And I know Mark, Mark knows this. Uh, but you know what's interesting? So in 2011, 2012, and we had, we were, we reached a, we were I mean we were at Alexa top 100 site, so we were just doing 60 million uniques a month or something like that. Uh, and and then what happened was to build it. It was an ad based model. I mean to build an ad base, especially with video, which back then video was even more expensive than it is now. It was very expensive for us to to do. Um, you needed scale like like even Twitter struggles at the scale Twitter has to, to monetize. Um, and so I, we reached a point in the business where I either had to um, go compete head to head with YouTube and raise a lot more money. We'd already raised a lot of money, or um, I had to go buy content, which I'm not. I'm not the biggest believer in that concept, um, but unless you're like Netflix and they had the you know, whole reason why I believe that. But it just hasn't worked typically for video platforms. Um, and or, or you know what I did, I, I did some test. With an inter as an enterprise company, and the test proved out, and, and ultimately what I did in 2012 is I went to our board. And I said, "Look, I'm just going to pivot the whole business model to become an enterprise SaaS business, to where we are today, which is we do. I mean, most of my business actually comes from like internal streaming. We power massive corporations, internal town halls, internal training, internal sales training. Most people don't know this. Um, they pay a lot of money. It's high margin. We went from a 80 or excuse me, about a 45% gross margin business to an 82% gross margin business right now. Um, and so, in, in, and in an environment where, you know, these Series C, these bigger companies, unless you're like showing that really next high level of growth, you have trouble, you'll have trouble fundraising. And so I didn't have to fundraise again. Um, I, I've t essentially turned my company profitable at 250 people, which is unheard of in video, um, you know, on a $40 million revenue run rate. Um, and so that's, and then the, what's was challenge about that was just internally. Um, it wasn't that bad in the market, but like internally, just even though my company wasn't that big, um, I mean, we had to lay off a lot of people and I had to change skill sets. I fired my whole management team. Um, and though from, so that part is what I mean by from our stress of leading an organization through a complete change where on the one hand we were used to go, yeah, let's go save the world and go you know, be a part of the Arab Spring and go, you know, Putin attacked us and the Russians were attacking us because we were, we were getting all these streams out of Russia. Now people were like could rally around that to then saying, hey, why don't we go do an internal stream for, for Cisco? You know, <laughs> and so we, I had to change, I didn't change all my develop, all the engineers, but I'd almost change everything. And that, that was, uh, um, I had a lot of sleepless nights for sure. So uh, it's a good segue into your growth um, and how you were able to get to that point to, you know, where you're able to even do that. Um, so a lot of startups that get going, um, they hit kind of a plateau. Tell me about how you kept that increase in growth, the momentum going, um, what it took or, or what certain steps you did um, to make that happen and, and how you kept that ball rolling. Well, we plateaued. <laughs> We definitely plateaued. Um, and so like, if you look at our growth curves, it was like this, and then it just went shoo, like plateaued and maybe even started going down. Um, and so we, we, I mean, I think every startup reaches it. Um, those were some of the hardest days of our lives. I think from um, what the decision we made is, is, I think as I mentioned, is I decided that it completely changed the business at that point. Um, I, we had had opportunities to sell the company earlier. We didn't take them, um, you know, and for a variety of reasons, we didn't do it. Um, and and so we, we literally, when we hit the plateau, one thing you can do is go um, try to change the trajectory, which is which is hard. Facebook actually, believe it or not, went through a, you wouldn't think Facebook, they were actually growing in, I think it was like 2008, and then they hit a plateau for three straight months. They had, they had stagnant user growth. What they did is they put a, they put a team together um, and um, a, like a tiger team and they just uh, like a growth team and they just they just hacked their way to find to find the next trajectory the decision I made which was not to do we, we tried some of that stuff and it wasn't working was literally to go where our growth was which was on the enterprise side so it was interesting because at 60 million uniques you know we had an ad business that was 10 million or I think 10 or, I can't remember what it was 10 million or 12 million dollars 15 million dollars in ad revenue and then and then in eight months 
um, I would already, with, with enterprise SaaS, had already almost passed that number with eight months worth of work with a small team dedicated to it. So what I chose to do is I tried to, f I followed where our growth was, other than fight where the, where the growth was not and try to fix it, I just went where it was. I felt it was a, a path of least resistance. It was, it was higher quality revenue for us um, because it, the profit, because we'd already raised a lot and the, you know, the fact that it, I could churn so much money back into the business to keep it running through that revenue growth. Um, and what we ultimately did, when I exited, we were on a 40 million, almost a $40 million run rate. Basically, my ad revenue, I like shifted. We never had a decline in rate over your revenue at all, but ad revenue went down and SaaS revenue went up. So I'd, I almost had a sh had two years where I was shifting my revenue type, um, and it's still it's still a growth overall. Um, but but the mix I completely changed the mix of our revenue streams um, during during that period. So that was a decision that we made. So. Tell me a little bit about um, before, I know now your numbers are probably a little bit more private than um, what they were before you got acquired, but right before acquisition, uh, give me an idea of scope. How big did you become? Um, what did your numbers look like before um, this IBM thing even came up? What, what were you looking at? Like which numbers? Like revenue numbers? Revenue, employees, how, how yeah. big did you get? We were uh, 200 and something plus or minus employees um, globally. We're, ba we're headquarters still are out of San Francisco. We've got, we had a big office in Budapest, really cool office in Budapest. In fact, we're the biggest internet exit ever in Hungary, which was kind of cool. Um, in, in we, uh, we had an office in Korea and an office in Tokyo. Um, and then we had people kind of scattered in other places. Um, we were on a f about a $40 million run rate in terms of revenue, um, profitable, not much, but we're, we're profitable. And, um, you know, we have, have probably 5,000, uh, had at the time 5,000 paying customers of various size and scale. Um, some of the biggest companies in the world were paying us lots of money to small, medium-sized businesses. And then we, I mean, we have on our free platform, we probably have um, 3 million, 4 million at the t time actual broadcasters. And then, you know, we still would do 40 million uniques a month, something like that at the exit. And how did you no, initially... But unique, and through embeds and stuff in the uniques. Gotcha. So how did you initially uh, get in contact? How did IBM this even start? Where did the conversation start? Was it you? Was it them? How did this all kind of initially, the initial contact, how did that happen? Um, we, uh, it was funny, is, uh, there's a guy, and I don't know Ryan knows him, named Ted Wang in Silicon Valley. Ted is, uh, he was one of the very first person I got very lucky and met. Ted is, was Facebook's lawyer, Twitter's lawyer, uh, Dropbox's lawyer, you name it, every cool consumer property he was their lawyer for. He's a really good, really good lawyer. And um, not to promote another lawyer. <laughs> you, don't use, you don't want to use Ted Wang. But, but, but the point I'm telling you, he told me something. He said, companies are, are bought, they're not sold. Um, and I 100% believe that. Now, sometimes they are sold, but it's like winning the lotto. I mean, and so we, um, we, we started building relationships with companies that we thought could eventually buy us um, and try to do business development relationships and some partnerships because that's, that's how it starts. They got to get comfortable with you, especially bigger companies. I mean, when you, you know, it's, it's, you, they need to know you, they know the team, they know the tech. Um, and so we, we, um, we did that with a bunch of companies. We did some partnerships and with IBM, we had a partnership to be in um, some, of their, some of their new, new um, platforms that they were launching got to know us, got to know my tech team. Um, and, you know, they started, it's like a dance, you know, they're kind of dancing with you a little bit. You're kind of dancing back, and, but you don't want to dance too close yet. So you're kind of, you know, so we, we played all those, those weird little games. And, um, and then, but ultimately, they, uh, they, then they were just very blunt about it. They said, look, we, we don't, we're not in video. IBM actually, believe it or not, had zero video assets at all. And it's a company that has 400,000 employees, probably still the number one enterprise company in the world. You know, they throw off $5 billion in EBITDA a quarter. It's a massive company. They had, and, and, and they're making, we, I guess we, I should say we, IBM is making big plays in cognitive, and you heard of Watson, and their data is everything. And the largest data source on the internet is video. I mean, 60 to 70% of all internet traffic is video. People don't know this. And IBM had no visibility into that. And so um, they bought us, and they bought another company at the same time to build this, this cloud video unit. Um, and they want to, they want to, um, we want to, you know, do big things in the video space. And so 
were you always thinking about acquisition when you were in talks with IBM? Um, or was that, again, just a strategic relationship that maybe could turn into that? Um, and then also, were you always looking for acquisition as an exit? Um, you never want to look for acquisition. Well, you, I mean, let's see for sure. There's three ways to exit a company. There's only three ways. You go out of business, you go public, or you, you get acquired, right? And hopefully you don't go out of business, but most companies go out of business, and it's really hard to go public. And so the, the only other, the most viable option for return is an acquisition. Um, and, you know, I had my moments where I would think about it more, think about it less. One thing I will say, and I've seen this so many times, yeah, honestly, if you don't love what you're doing, you're not going to get acquired. I mean, you will, you, it's like playing, again, sometimes you bet on black and you win, sometimes you bet on, you know, you play poker and, I don't, you know, I don't know, you know, blah, 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 kings and I don't know, play poker, but sometimes you win, sometimes you, sometimes you lose. It's what you're gambling. And you will, I mean, you gamble, okay, fine. If you love what you do and actually believe in it, you will figure, you'll probably figure it out and may, you may get acquired one day. Uh, but it's not the end result. Um, I, I would have loved if I got acquired. I would love money. You know, you know I love the whatever that comes with that. And, but, you know, if you didn't love what you're doing, I could have done this for 20 or 30 years. I don't like to travel back and forth necessarily, but I, I genuinely love the video space. And so um, um, I wouldn't, I don't, would never if someone if someone's thinking about like I, I when i've invested i've never asked about an exit strategy like who cares go love what you do go love your customers go really get inside the mind of the customer get in their hearts of the customers and what they want and go build things for them and then that's how you do it because if you're looking for the exit all the time um you know you're not going to put in the effort and you know you're going to cut corners and make short-term decisions um that being said you, if especially as a CEO, you are the chief, everything, sales officer, product officer, evangelist. You're the chief exploration officer. So you got to explore partnerships, new employees, and acquisitions. Um, and that's just the name of the game because investors, it's not charity. They at some point want their money back. Um, and so, you know, what we did, we would, we would, we did partnerships. We wouldn't do partnerships just to do it to get acquired. It was it had to make sense. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't work anyways because it, you know, it doesn't make sense. It's not going to work for them. It's not going to work for you. You're, they're not going to acquire you. Um, and you know you do that smartly and intelligently. And if it works out, great. If it doesn't, then you love what you're doing. You're responsible. You build a good business. And you can do it forever. So you mentioned that you had a couple other companies that had uh, tried to acquire you before. And you didn't take those offers. You did take IBM. Tell us about how you go about picking um, the right person that you want to, I guess, sell to? Well, one, the early ones, one we did not, we passed on. Actually, one early, early we passed on. It just was, felt like it was too early. It felt like we could make it bigger. Um, we had one that was very close, and they passed on us, and I'll tell you what it is. Um, in 2000, I think it was 2011, Sony actually approached us to buy us. Um, and we went through all the diligence. Um, they were going to pay even more than I sold the company for recently. Um, everything was done. And we negotiated the term sheet. And the way this works is you negotiate all the, you know, the upfront term sheet, and then you sign the term sheet, and then you go through more diligence, and then docs, and then you, then you sell. Um, final docs, closing docs, and everything. So we, um, we went through, we were negotiating the term sheet, took like a week, all the terms, or maybe two weeks. And they were supposed to sign it on like a Tuesday. Or no, on a Thursday, the CEO had to sign, or somebody, somebody EVP or something had to sign it. On Tuesday before they were signed, on the Tuesday before the Thursday when they were going to sign it, was the Japanese earthquake um, and the tsunami that that followed. And so ultimately, what happened was, I mean, so when that happened, obviously Japan was in Sony's headquarters of Japan. Japan was in, in disarray. We had a big presence in Japan, um, and they told us, hey, look, you know, we just we're gonna, still going to do it, but everything going on. The CEO's traveling, and what ended up happening after a couple of weeks, they just finally said, look, there's just too much going on right now. And Sony had, was in some trouble at that point. Um, so, so that, we, we did, not, did not do that deal. We made some mistakes around that, how we communicate that as well, we can talk about. But we, um, um, and then, you know, but for IBM, what I liked about them, and we had, we had other offers this time too. Um, one, they were gonna pay the most money, so that's pretty good criteria. But two, I, I actually like the people. Like, so the people I was interacting with when I was the other three, two companies that we were talking to, um, I actually didn't like the people. I was like, I, just, I don't, 
I don't, I don't want to work here. I don't, and if I don't want to work here, my employees, because it really hits you. I, after I signed the dotted line, um, it's one thing for the founders, you know, to, they're, they're going to do really, very well. You've got hundreds of people's lives that are, and we want, the deer in the headlights look when you tell them that you sold in your company. That sounds easy. It is not easy to look a bunch of people in the eyes and go, guess what, guys, all that stuff I've been saying, you know, now we're going to go do it with this company. And then all the questions come out and they, they're fearful of their jobs as being layoffs. And, um, and so I knew that was coming. And so I wanted to make sure it was a place that I felt like would be um, someplace that I would want to work. And, and, you know, as big as IBM is, it's actually a really cool company. Um, they're, they're being very aggressive in cloud in the space that I believe in. Um, and they've given it, they believe in us. And so they, it's not like they had other video assets to like kind of cobble us into. I mean, they're looking, they're like, they know nothing about video. So they're like, well, what do you guys think? And we're like, we want to go this way. And they're like, all right, let's go. I mean, that's, and so that's kind of cool. Um, and, and, you know, I, I uh, you know, and, and ultimately is just what my gut, my heart told me was the right thing for the company. So uh, tell me a little bit about, um I guess where you're headed now. So now you are a part of a global company that's doing really big things, and sounds like you have a lot of freedom based on what you just said. Um, so tell me what what we should, uh, what you can say now that you're part of IBM. Um, what we should expect out of you guys. So, um, and I'll just, I mean, I somewhat talk generically, but video is the most powerful medium in the world. Um, and it's not even so much that you can see the video, I mean, the pictures you can see, but it's that you can actually feel it. And it doesn't matter if it's a movie, there's something about it, 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 it creates emotion in your body. Um, it's your kid's graduation, there's emotion in their body. When I watched the, my favorite moment on Yushim ever, we powered the Mars rover landing for NASA, a Curiosity, I think it was the name of the, the, was the rover. And, and watching that live and experiencing it with the world was just like, made, almost made me cry. We had the SpaceX stuff, last week and you know I got that same kind of not as big but kind of same chills when they landed the rocket we did the Tesla launch um, a couple of weeks ago and listened to Elon talk about the future of electric cars um, all the way to the what was the thing where you pour the ice bucket thing on your head oh, you know challenge. you know there's a reason video is powerful mm -hmm. and where we're what, what IBM is doing what I'm doing with them what gets me so excited is we want to take that same emotion and be the be the technology layer be the platform but then they, they have this thing called Watson, which is one of the, the smartest um, data, uh, cognitive data points or cognitive supercomputing capabilities in the world, and they're, they're exposing it to the world. Um, and it's, it's pulling in all these different data sources. And they just spent $2 billion, I think that's public, with, uh, the, for the weather company just to get the weather data points. And what's going to start happening, you see what's happening in a video. Of course, everybody knows Facebook's doing video and you can't go through your timeline. I tell you a funny story about how they thought I was idiot, an idiot for doing some of the stuff they're doing now back then and sidebar conversation over beer or something but they um but to, to twitter's doing video and of course i mean i live under a rock and i'll be using netflix or hbo now so that stuff's all great but what starts getting really cool is you start thinking about police cams and all the challenges you've seen in some of these cities and a police officer and again some of this is actually kind of scary but a police officer's walking up to a scene he's doing and it's automatically doing live facial recognition of you and it goes back in his ear and says you're and I, i'm joking but you know you're a convicted felon you're you're a high-risk convicted felon you're likely armed shouldn't a police officer know that information or it hears gunshots in the background automatically because it's monitoring his feed it knows it knows that that's probably a shotgun based on the, the, the noise acoustics um, or a nine millimeter. And there was actually two of them. There were two other shots that they knew that was not the officers. Either the officers were automatically dispatching, you know, police. Or in Texas, did we, didn't we, didn't it just, I was gone. Didn't it just hail here somewhere? So, okay. So they, they send out, so rather than send an adjuster out to your house and they get up on your roof, and if everybody's ever had a new roof, it's the stupidest thing in the world. The guy gets on your roof. He draws circles on the dots, and then he counts the number of dots, and that's like determines if you get a new roof or not. It blows my mind. But what they needed, what they're gonna do, what will happen is they'll they'll send up a drone over neighborhoods that are high likelihood. They know exactly where the hailstorm happened. They'll just fly the drone around, and if they'll know who if they're if, they're, if it's their house, they'll look at it. They'll analyze the video image. It'll all happen in real time, or it could be or after the fact. They'll know based on the algorithms, and it'll get smarter if it actually had hail damage. And they'll just send you a check in the mail and go tell you you get a new roof. And they saved a ton of money on, on labor and everything else. So, so video to, to, to things like, um, um, you know, 
one percent of all warehouse sales um, are one re- percent of uh, companies like Walmart lose one percent of their distribution revenue from from people stealing stuff. Um, but if you use video, you can do facial recognition. You can monitor heart rates. You can, you can use heat. You can see if people are getting hot. People send off, you know, cues. You can actually know if they're actually in the process of stealing something. So there's a million of these things like this that video can play into. I mean, they're putting video and people laugh. The Samsung put a video uh, camera inside some of their new refrigerators. You laugh at that. I think that's actually pretty cool uh, because now you can see if you actually need milk or not because that happens to me all the time. Um, and there's other ways to do it, but video, so that's, that's, where, that's where it's going. Telemedicine, I got sick in uh, San Francisco a while back and I still stay in a hotel and I don't have a place. Um, and I, I mean, I was sick. Um, and I did not want to leave the hotel room. And I, you know, I called a little doctor on my phone and they, they, they talked to me. You know, it's, it's amazing. Um, and video and IBM will play in all these parts and, and they can do it on a global scale. So I'm gonna ask you one last question so we can leave uh, a few minutes for any um, audience questions. But I do have a question for you um, just because you've been in the community um, since before we really had any momentum in the startup community to see what it's come to now, um, which it's still, it's, still, it's still working. It's still trying to get, you know, fully, the ball fully moving. Tell me a little bit about your take on if you could compare uh, what was available in the startup community when you first started to what you're seeing now and, and even what you're seeing maybe even based on this week. So compare Dallas back then to Dallas now or yes. compare San Francisco to Dallas? Well, I don't think it's fair to compare San Francisco to Dallas. Yeah. Back then, <laughs> I think it's a little different I mean, back, story. Back then, back then to now. Well, yeah, um, yeah you um, could compare you know, just the general face of Dallas and what it faces from back then to now. Well, I will say in San Francisco, it is not unusual, and this happened all the time, we would just get, you go pitch a guy and they hand you a $50,000 check, and they say, send me the paperwork. So it is a, it is a, it is a different thing that I wouldn't compare, um, and we shouldn't compare, it's a different city. Um, I think it's, um, from what I could tell, um, and, and many of you are closer to the scene than I am, um, I think it's certainly gotten better. I mean, you have now you have, you know, things like tech wildcatters. You have Startup Week, which this stuff didn't happen, you know, in 07, 08, um, 09. Um, you had some exits for some companies locally. You know, some of them have been big, SoftLayer being, I don't know if it's the biggest, but one of, certainly one of the biggest. Um, you have some verticals where it feels like Dallas is sort of starting to get some traction in. Um, and, and, and so there, there's a, I think there's a lot of things happening. There's, there, there's a lot of people who are wanting this to be and certainly you look down to Austin and there's the jealousy thing um, that the fact that they have, you know, an emerging sort of market that's, that's respected. Um, I think that from what I can tell, having just went through a company um, to try to raise here, um, it's still very hard. Um, there's no doubt about it. Uh, Dallas is unique in that you've got three universities, however many universities here, and not like one university like, like you know, Stanford, that's sort of the dominant one in Silicon Valley or Maybe it's UT, UT in Austin. Um, you, you have several major cities that are sort of spread out, um, and everybody's spread out in general. Um, you have um, a investor base who, um, you know, has gotten a lot better, but still, it's still, you know, it's old family money and it's oil money and, um, you know, and this internet thing. And, you know, so, but again, it's gotten better. And it seems what I'm hearing, you can still get checks that are, on the smaller size, when I was talking around earlier, it sounds like it's still hard to get, you know, $5 million checks or $2 million checks or 10 million. Some businesses need, cap, need capital. Um, the good part about all this though, is that there is a community, there is talent, there are major corporations here that are headquartered here that are putting out talent as well. Um, there's a, more information on the internet than there ever has been. Um, and you don't need as much money to start a company. I mean, when I literally, when we started Ustream, I had to buy the servers. I mean, you get on AWS and turn up a business in like, like two seconds. Um, that was not the case. And so there's zero reason why companies can't grow at scale to something very large here. Um, and and, and uh, the, the, the other part about it is, uh, I think the, the, in terms of exits, um, the companies are more willing to buy in different locations than they were before. Um, investors are probably are, are increasingly more willing to think a little bit more broadly. Now, are you, get, are you gonna get the top Silicon Valley investor to come invest in a company in Dallas? No, probably not, um, unless you know, unless you have some connections. Why? It's real simple. They don't wanna get on a plane and go to board meetings. And they need, they, you can invest in a company at, with a lot of money and not go to the board meeting in person. It's just, it's super, 
And so what do we need? We, I mean, it is, a, you need, we're gonna have to get some more investors here. I don't, I don't know all the solution to it. I, I've always kind of wished uh, Cuban was a little bit more involved and I'd love to see Lance Crosby invest more locally and, um, and, and but we need, there's, there's still, we're still missing something, there's no doubt about it. Um, and, and, but it's gonna, there's gonna be some great entrepreneurs that are gonna, I mean, it's obstacles. If it was easy, everybody was doing it, right? I, someone used to tell me the best real estate deals are the ones with hair on them. Why? Because they're hard to do. That's where you make the most money. Someone's going to figure it out and they'll be companies that are literally born here, started here, exit, fully exit here. Um, and it's going to be some great entrepreneur and, and they'll put, start putting things on the map. But it's, it's, there's, you can build a company anywhere now. I mean, there's exits happening in, in foreign countries and in Europe and Asia is exploding. You can, Dallas certainly has all the ingredients to do it now. Um, and it just may be a timing thing. And I have, and now there's a lot of cool companies up and coming too. Perfect. Um, Brad, this has been incredible, but I do want to open this up to you guys because you guys are the ones who are here and uh, we really appreciate you coming. Is there any specific questions from the audience um, now? That, oh, we will take our first one. <laughs> um, it, it, the way I define it is where I live at a certain points in time. So I almost live in two places. So, I mean, I live in Alito, believe it or not, which is like west of Fort Worth. Um, and I travel every week to pretty much every week to Dallas or to San Francisco. Um, and uh, I go back and forth. But you know, I'm also, the way I've also, you know, I don't certainly don't like it and enjoy it, but you do get in a little bit of a routine. Um, it's a three hour flight. You know, it's a two hour time zone difference. If I take the 6 a.m. flight, which I stopped doing, cause I feel like I'm getting too old for that. But it, if I take the 6 a.m. flight, I can be in the office by 8.30. Um, now I'd fly back on Thursday nights or fly back on Fridays. Um, sometimes I would stay over on the weekends, but usually not. And I come back to Texas, uh, you know, and, but then, you know, other well, some weeks I'm never, I mean, I'm in New York or I'm in Dubai or I'm in Japan and then I'm in Atlanta. Like next week I'm in Vegas and then I'm in Atlanta and then I'm in Budapest. Um, so, you know, you, if you want to, as you start getting bigger, you have, these are the things you have, I mean, you live on the, you live on a plane. That's just the, the trade off you have to make. And whether it's, Live on a plane, travel in city, 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 to get back home, or you go to one place and go back. It doesn't really, doesn't really matter. Um, that's just, that's the life I live, and that's part of the trade-off. Any other questions? Yeah, I know. I'm a big proponent of crowdfunding. Um, I never, that, that's another one that was not even available when I, when we started Ustream. Um, I'm a bit, I, I, I people are going to give you money and not really send them a plaque or whatever, have, have dinner with you when you're successful or send them an early product. I mean, pre-sales of product. I mean, shoot, Elon Musk sold his Model 3 and he got like $10 billion in sales in two days. Um, and I like to think we had a little bit to do with it because we streamed it. But, you know, <laughs> get your pre-sell. I mean, absolutely. Why not? I mean, I don't know what your, your company is. Software companies are a little harder to pre-sell, but certainly physical products you can pre-sell like crazy. Um, I'm, so I'm a big proponent of that. Um, you know, funding, fundraising, it doesn't even matter. I mean, I make it sound like it's real easy in Silicon Valley. I'm sort of being, I mean, we had a couple that were, felt like they were easy, but it is hard. You're gonna, you have to talk to people. Uh, pe uh, some entrepreneurs I'll talk to, like, oh, I'll talk to a couple of people. No, you get to talk to like 50 people. And you got to talk to like one person and ask for three other contacts and talk to one person and ask for three other contacts. It is hard to do. It is not fun. Um, it's worse than getting a loan from the bank times 100 um, because you're going to hear no, no, no. Most, and particularly if you get to like professional investors, they, they'll do one deal, deal a year or one, a, you know, maybe two a year. Um, so it is hard. But you just got to, I mean, Lance Crosby from Software will tell you, he talked to like 70 people, got told no, and then he finally found one. I mean, you just have to, it goes back to tenacity. Um, there was a guy when I was getting out of the army, a guy named Greg Ruff, and I only met him once. I'll never forget his name. I was flying back to Dallas. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And he was an entrepreneur and started a bunch of companies. And, I, and he, uh, he told me a story, and I'll never forget it, and it stayed with me, which was, he said, being in startups is kind of like shooting a basketball. They're in a basketball game. You're going to shoot once, you're going to miss. You're going to shoot once, you're going to miss. But if you just keep shooting the basket, eventually you're going to make it in. Um, and he told me that, that analogy helped him get through a lot of dark times where he felt like quitting. Most entrepreneurs fail because they quit. 
in, in his experience, and which happened to be almost my exact, I mean, I almost quit a million times. Not a million, but like at least two, three, four, five times. And, you know, somehow you just, when your back's against the wall, um, and I don't recommend it for everybody. Some, some, of you, some people will, will fail, and it's just the nature of the beast. But for me, it was always somehow, you know, that adversity um, produces something in you and the situation that you find something. There's always a solution. I mean, you know, put men on the moon, for God's sake, right? So we can, there's some solution. And fundraising is the same thing. And as hard as it is here, I, I, you know, I, I, I fundraise from people here in, in an industry that I have nothing, I know nothing about with some people that were, um, you know, not, didn't have experience fundraising. We found money. It was just painful. It was very hard. Um, and that's just, and so the initially what I, wherever you can get it, you know, is it your friends, is it your family? Is it the guy down the street? Is it, is it an incubator? Is it crowdfunding? You know, if you, if, if, if you don't have tons of capital, like now I could probably fundraise easier because I haven't have an exit. If you don't have that, that luxury, you know, what does it matter where the money comes from? Just go get the money. Um, and we candidly, and I don't recommend this for everybody. We did venture debt too. I don't, there's is anybody locally doing venture debt here. No, but basically we took a, we took a high risk loan out against the business where if it failed, they would take all the IP. I mean, there are sometimes desperate times for call for desperate measures. We and it saved the company in the early days. So there are, there's almost always some mechanism, whether it's grants, crowdfunding, angels, um, super angels, incubators, sell, pre-sell your product. Um, you know, anything that's legal is probably on the table. Um, and it's not, it's not easy. And we can go into more specifics, but tenacity just is number one. And we had a question over here. What? A charity? But we certainly didn't do that because we took a long time to get profitable. Um, I honestly don't know much about that. The only example I know is I've seen one startup tried, and I don't know if it happened to him. Then the, the shoe guy that did that. Um, it, you know, I, I, Tom Toms or whatever they were Toms. I hate those shoes, but whatever. <laughs> they just hurt. They hurt my feet. But but I, I honestly I don't know the answer to that. Um, in a, my personal opinion, um, uh, ph philanthropy is great, and being aware of your community is great. Um, the cold hard reality is this is a business, and anything that distracts you from ultimately getting a product to customers that the people are willing to pay you for somehow you can monetize is a distraction. And I don't mean that in a mean way. I just don't, I don't, I don't know enough. I don't have a ton of experience in that. And it's, it's, it, it always felt like a little bit more to me, like a marketing gimmick than an actual, um, and the, that always kind of bugged me is that, you know, you're really true to it. Can you really build a business? And, and then I look at myself as an angel investor, would I invest in a company that's doing that? Maybe, um, and there's probably data, there's probably companies that have done it very successfully that I'm not aware of, um, but I would caution like that. It might seems like a little bit of a dis distraction. I can, I'm one data point, and I'm, I know there's been I know I know there's been companies that have done it successfully. So I, we did not do that. Now what we did do, um, as we had a company and people, we were very involved with um, um, trying. Well, I, now I say that now I'm actually we did do it. We, uh, we didn't do it for in the way like a Tom's did. I thought it was kind of like a marketing campaign. We, I mean, we're very involved in San Francisco. We do cleanup day. And there's a problem with needles all around our office. There's so many homeless people. So we do a lot of trash pickup, stuff like that. Um, clean up your neighborhood day. We've done stuff where we've donated our services to others um, that really didn't cost us a lot of dollars that were done on the weekends. We, we donated, I had a program um, called Ustream for Change. It's still going on. Um, actually, I think, sorry, IBM made me kill it, but, but we had it for a couple of years. Um, it wasn't a nonprofit, but it was an employee run comp, uh, organization where we donated our services. If you were going to um, support uh, governments that are open governments, democracies, and stable societies, anything within that bell, cr that curve, we would donate our services, but it didn't cost us anything. It was just our time. So we did things like that, but we didn't really promote it all that much. It was more, more for the intrinsic value of bringing the team together and doing something for the community or in the broader community. And we'll take one last question right here. Um, my name is Danny Martin. That $300,000 that you received, did that individual, Earl Jr., ask for any equity? And then the individuals that you came 
together with on this idea? Did you guys, how did you separate the equity? And then are those same individuals still with you today, even at the acquisition? Um, definitely ask for equity. Um, he definitely, I mean, businessman. He, and then you don't want free, I mean, he, he, they would never, if an investor is giving you free money, um, it's either usually the government or it's customers paying up front or it's crowdsourcing, things like that. But most people, if they're actually going to hand you a check, they're going to want equity. Um, and he, yeah, he definitely, he definitely got equity um, from, from, from you, sure. Um, in terms of splitting up the, the, the equity, that, that's always the hardest conversation. My advice when I tell people is the sooner you can have those conversations, the better, because the longer you wait, it causes so many issues. And all should not be equal. Because what ends up happening is usually one person becomes the, the CEO, one person becomes like the main person leading the organization or the main tech guy. Um, and if you have, I don't know how many founders you would have, but if you have two, three, four founders, you can't have the same equity. Um, and the sooner you can have that conversation earlier on roles, it's just the nature of the beast. And it's always a very tough and uncomfortable t conversation. We waited too long and it turned out to be just a very, very, very uncomfortable situation. Because when it happens, you're like, I'm doing all the work and me, you got the same equity and gosh, I'm bringing all the value. And you may not be working as hard, or maybe you are working as hard, but you're just not, it's a different, it's a slice of the business. Um, it's, it's really hard. There's actually some good tools on the internet. Um, I don't know, the, do you know the name of the websites of those tools? Brian, by chance, I'm calling you out, but there's some, there's some, there's some actually pre, some pretty cool tools where you actually do some, some equity calculators based on the role. Um, there's no perfect answer, but there are some rules of thumbs that, you know, some of the major um, VCs and some of the major accelerators use. But equal is, uh, I don't recommend, um, particularly for for more than a couple founders. If it's two of you, maybe, maybe, and it's like you and the CTO, maybe. I will say, I didn't start off as our CEO. I took over in 2011. Um, and um, it, it, I will, we had equal, me and him, but it was, it was both of us. But being in charge and the pressures, as much as I thought I felt them, until you're actually in charge, you can't even describe it. So, what was my age? Uh, at that time, well, when we started the company, I think I was like 27, something like that. Um, and, um, and then one, so two of the founders were still at the company when we exited and me and, and my CTO are still there and one, one had moved on. All right. Well, I just want to thank Brad. I Ron think has a question. Ron has a question. Oh, <laughs> oh here we go. Yeah. It's, it's a very real good question it's a really it's a really it's a, it's a very difficult very difficult conversations because yeah I my personal opinion I think the CEO should pay should have the highest equity he has the most responsibility it's going to be when things burn they're going to point at him it's that person's name that's going to get you know smeared the CTO should in the tech company should probably be second and you know if you're the you're a founder and you're the head of BD no offense to head of BDs you're great or VP of BD but your equity shouldn't be the same as those two individuals my, my opinion and there's the rules of thumb you know and expect it to go down every round you're not gonna, it's gonna always gonna go down all right brad thank you again uh we really appreciate all the insight you did a great job um and thank you guys so much for joining us this evening and we hope you enjoy the rest of startup week thanks everyone